And it's BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. My guest on the program today is Mike Morford. Most of you guys have seen him in some corner of YouTube or the podcast circuit. And Morford and I have also appeared together on Planet X Filmworks, the Citizen Detective podcast, which he co-hosts, as well as the Zodiac Killer Channel's interview with the Experts series. Today we're going to be talking about the Golden State Killer. Mike Morford has also been part of the Criminology Podcast, which even put out a publication called The Criminology Podcast Presents the Case of the Golden State Killer, where you can read the uh, text of their discussions in book form. Morph, how you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing just fine, yes. And Morph, you are coming to us from Florida, right? Yep, I'm in Florida. Ah, uh, yes, I miss the East Coast so much. Over here in the Philippines now, quite a ways okay. away, but... Are you visiting or over there for good? Well, for good's a long time, but let's see how long it goes. Yeah, gotcha. So probably Morf, hot though. You... It's probably hot though, I imagine, just like it is here in Florida. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Unbelievably. One season, summer, every single day. And I'm not yeah. a summer person. I'm from West Virginia. We stay in the mountains and just get some cool breezes. Uh, I don't really have that here. A little bit different. <laughs> Yes, but Morph, would you like to provide an introduction to your research journey into the Golden State Killer mystery? Yeah, so I, you know, I had done a lot of work on the Zodiac case over the years. I'd done a lot of researching and, and writing and obtaining reports and contacting different, you know, investigators past and present. So I, I spent a lot of time on that case and that was sort of you know, with that case, you know it well. You get burned out after a while. You've got to have a little bit of a break. And I was at that point where I, you know, the break was just needed because I just, you know, spent so many hours going into the night just reading stuff and rereading it and going down different rabbit holes. And I said, I need to step back from this case. And, you know, I had worked a little bit with Michelle McNamara, the author um, of the Golden State Killer book. She's the one that term you know, the phrase Golden State Killer gave him a name. Um, and, you know, we had done a couple different projects. I wrote something for her blog. I had appeared on a show that she hosted, you know, way back in the day talking about Zodiac. And, you know, she reached out to me and she said, I know you do a lot of Zodiac stuff, but I, you know, I'm really wrapped up for for her. The Golden State Killer case was like the Zodiac case for for us. She was just wrapped into it and 24 seven, she was locked in and, you know, she asked if, you know, I wanted to help maybe dig into a little bit and do some of the stuff I did on Zodiac w with her case. And at the time I was just so burned out at, you know, cause I'm doing different podcast stuff and I'm, I had a job at the same time where I was working full time and doing the podcast. And I, I just didn't have the, the time I felt to really commit to, um, that so I, you know i passed and i said you know i'm not going to be able to do it right now um but i was familiar with the the case obviously because people had theorized that maybe the golden state killer was zodiac or something so i knew a little bit about the case knew a general uh you know background of the case but i you know i wasn't deeply knowledgeable of the case and i passed and then you know it wasn't that long after that michelle unfortunately passed away um and when she did you know i, I sort of said to myself wow i feel really bad for you know because she was a pretty nice person um was one of us that you know gets wrapped up in true crime and stuff and she was somebody that was asking if i'd be interested in working with her and i sort of declined that and i regretted it so i decided after she passed away that i'm gonna dive in hook line and sink her to the the golden state killer case so that's how it got started for me and i i was fortunate enough uh, you know i had some different introductions i knew some of the people involved i got introduced real quick i knew people like paul holes um so i had some ins where i could immediately jump in and i was able to get different access to reports and files and really spent a lot of time just reading the background of the case and getting to know the case well and getting to know the ins and outs of it and i just you know it became the new zodiac i was just 24 7 that's all i was doing and i was you know it's a good thing in the end because i you know i feel like we really pushed that case forward and got it out into the spotlight which was our intention uh but it you know it left me at the end of that really burned out and sort of like what i was before with zodiac i was just tired i was 
paranoid. I was constantly checking doors to make sure they were locked and waking up in the middle of the night, making sure I put the alarm on and things like that. So it was a, you know, it was a real experience as far as that goes, jumping into the case and and dealing with it and then seeing it all the way through until an arrest came. Ah, uh, yes, and you were talking about Michelle McNamara and the book that she authored, of course, is All Be Gone in the Dark. And when you said she asked you to work with her and you said no, what exactly was that um, interaction like and what's the lead up? And you mentioned how you regretted it. Like, what, would, what do you mean exactly she asked you to work with her? Well, it's, you know, she had a, a blog called True Crime Diary um, and it had some great articles. And I, I think it's gone offline now, um, but it was up for a while after she passed away um, but she had some great cases on there that I really I loved reading her blog because there were cases that appealed to me I you know one time she said something that was what I agree with fully there's a something about unknown cases where you don't have resolution where you don't know the answers that really appealed to her and that's the same with me and I feel like once you find out the case gets solved and who it was it's cool but at the same time it loses that I like not knowing. I like trying to figure out like a puzzle, the answers. Um, So I I think we were sort of the same in that regard. But she was someone just like us, you know, someone that digs a lot and reads a lot and gets reports and goes through them and rereads them. And, um, you know, so I she was someone like me that I think, you know, we would have worked well, you know, on the case, um, discussing it and um, bouncing stuff off each other and I, I just sort of regretted not um taking her up on that offer um when she passed away and that's that's really what got me into the case was deciding that i'm gonna you know i should have done it then but i'll do it now i'm gonna dive into it and that's how i got started okay and what year did you have the interactions uh, with michelle mcnamara obviously this would be prior to the um prior to the solving of the golden state killer mystery but when was this Oh, I, I, it's been, I can't even remember how long it was. I'm guessing it was between 2010 and 2014 that we had interactions on her blog and the Zodiac case and some other cases, but not a lot of constant interaction, just sort of, you know, you know, I was on her show, wrote an article for a blog. We talked about a couple common cases that we were interested in, but it was really when she became hooked on the Golden State Killer case. I'm guessing it was around 2014 to 2015 that she um, reached out to me and then she passed away in 2016. Um, and that's when I really dove into it. Right. And I mean, this is all prior to us learning that the Golden State Killer was Joseph D'Angelo and more Miss. Please correct me if I misstate anything. He more or less had a reign of terror or period of activity from 1974 to 86, possibly 1973. Maybe he committed additional crimes after that. The Golden State Killer was someone whom they believe committed over 100 burglaries, over 50 rapes, and at least 12 or 13 murders. And what exactly did you think and feel when they identified the Golden State Killer as Joseph D'Angelo? I mean, he, when you unmask somebody like that, you, they're really, I think usually they're not who you picture, but, you know, I had, I had been on a show about the case, a documentary I did, and I, I the name's escaping me, the doc, Golden State Killer, It's Not Over was the name of the documentary, and um, in that case, one of the theories I was presenting on the show was that the Golden State Killer might have been a police officer or in some form of law enforcement or in some sort of, you know, law capacity. You know, at one of the scenes, there was a uh, a security badge found um, in, in the escape route that they thought he might have dropped. So I, I sort of presented that, but in the back of my mind, I didn't really feel that's what he was. I didn't think he was a cop. I really thought he was a, a low life criminal that spent 24 hours a day casing houses and robbing them and just was really good and i thought that he would have some kind of record for minor burglaries or robbery or something like that but nothing along the lines of rapes or murders that's who i thought he was going to turn out to be in my heart 
and then he turns out to be the the cop law enforcement type um that i presented in in that episode so you know i, I sort of felt that like he was going to be one or the other but i was leaning more towards the arch criminal that was robbing houses and stuff like that 24 hours a day but he turned out to be the cop I remember a particular quote from Paul Holes, of course, trying my best to recollect, and he said that he was also surprised that the Golden State Killer was D'Angelo. He thought there were suspects that were better and that should be higher on the list. He was very surprised when it turned out to be D'Angelo, but he absolutely accepted the result. Did you have a Golden State Killer suspect? I had I had a a good a pretty good amount uh you know I had work I had I, I can't even tell you the amount of I've done a lot of data mining with the Zodiac case and that's just basically plotting every house who lived where looking at their their backgrounds looking who lived in a circle uh, in an area around these attacks um and I I I could tell you almost everybody within a you know each mile of each house who had criminal records you know i had a list of probably 100 names of people that i thought should be worth you know the, the right age range they have records um they're within the right proximity that kind of stuff um and you know but i i really had whittled down a few names to some very interesting ones ones that had previous records for wearing ski masks when breaking into homes um one guy that i was really high on um lived right in rancho cordova where the very first attack happened he worked some odd hours he was a dj and um some of the crimes the golden state killer committed were down in orange county which is far from sacramento well this guy was going to college down there at that time so i said oh my gosh this guy is really high on my list now uh, i fit the overall description and i made a couple calls and i was very tight with with a few detectives on the case and i was able to get him streamlined for dna collection uh and they collected his dna and then they eventually got back to me and they said we were, he was promising he's not it he's not the guy and so i was wondering you know i asked him i, I feel bad now because i i basically sick the the investigators on this guy and i thought maybe they did it without his knowledge and they said no we went and asked him if he would voluntarily give a sample so somewhere out there this this poor guy who didn't have a criminal record by the way um but he just checked off so many boxes um that the police felt he was compelling enough to go ask him for his dna so he, he was probably shocked when they knocked on his door um and and collected his dna but he ultimately wasn't the killer um but I, I, I did have a small handful that you can count on one hand of, of very promising people that were either had their DNA collected or were on the list to, to have their DNA collected. Um, you know, you mentioned Paul and Paul had a, a, a theory that I was I was in 100 percent agreement with that. There was some kind of possible construction uh, aspect to the Golden State Killer because I mentioned a badge was found at one, a, a construction site, a security badge. So we were both thinking along the lines of a security guard that watches construction sites at night, something along those lines. Um, so we were both going down construction. You know, I don't want to speak for Paul, but we were spending a lot of time on the construction angle um, and spent a lot of time looking at people. And there was a construction company that did a lot of work between uh sacramento and uh santa barbara they would go back and forth down there to do these jobs and that's primarily where the golden state killer was operating was out of sacramento and uh, southern california and santa barbara so we spent a lot of time i i spent a countless time looking at um the construction angle and this construction company in particular um and in fact i think in that in that documentary the golden state killer it's not over i talk a little bit about the construction angle too you know in fact one of the bindings from one of the crime scenes was found uh in the yard of one of the people that own this construction company um and the, the there was trail police tracked the killer's escape route 
and it went towards another property. It led directly to another property that this family owned. So I said, I, th I think it might be somebody in this family. Um, so I had one of the people in that family for that construction company on the short list of people too, because the fact that bindings were found in his sister's yard, then he lives where they basically trailed, where they lost the trail. He lived right there in, in Santa Barbara. Um, so, you know, it, it was one big rabbit hole, just like, you know, with the Zodiac case, you can really go down and find some compelling things. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you're just, it's not the right person, you know, and, you know, there's still, to this day, there's a lot of stuff that's not known about Joseph D'Angelo. They don't know about his movements in Santa Barbara. Um, they don't know what he was doing down there for money. Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions, you know. Um, there's still a possibility that he had an accomplice uh, in possibly one or more of the crimes at one of the, the homes where he struck. Um, there were burglaries in the house right next to it. Um, there was a couple seen, a man and a woman. Um, there were instances in, in the Golden State Killer case up in when he was in Sacramento that people would hear talking between two different people and they could hear two distinct voices. One time they heard a doorbell ring uh, when he was in the middle of an attack and he went out there and talked to somebody. They heard horns beeping before. So there's a possibility that he had an accomplice someplace along the lines um, and and just so many things are still unknown to this day about him that I don't know if we're ever going to get answers on but it, it just goes to show you when you dig enough you find all these crazy crazy things that can lead you down a rabbit hole wow um absolutely fascinating but I would like to remind the audience that I'm talking to Mike Morford one of the co-authors of the criminology podcast presents the case of the Golden State Killer and if there's any true crime story that you would like covered here on Black Box Online Radio you can put your idea in the comment section down below you can also send it to me privately at Nedahan which is um, my email address is blackboxonlineradio at aol.com and feel free to visit some of the links in the description box one of them is for buymeacoffee.com buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on zodiac monday and one more time please like and subscribe really helps out the channel but i do have a follow-up question for you morph on that exact um, subject because in your time researching the golden state killer case how likely do you think it was that he had an accomplice do you agree or disagree with that theory i think it's i think it would be hard for somebody to not come forward if they had that information or maybe not be identified in some way or, you know, so I, or hold that secret, you know, so I tend to think that he probably didn't have one and it was just odd coincidences that maybe during this one attack, the doorbell rang and it just happened to be somebody at the wrong house and maybe somebody heard uh, during the attack a car horn and he went out of the room and went to the door maybe they thought he was talking to somebody but maybe he was just looking out there to see who was out there so i i think most likely he didn't have a uh, an accomplice but you know there's still enough puzzle pieces that haven't been collected to that i'd like to know more and i i don't know at this point because they've turned his life upside down everyone that knew him every job he ever had anything they could find and there's still unanswered questions that I don't know if we'll ever find the answers to and he's not talking so you know some of this may remain a mystery okay though but you also follow the Zodiac killer case very closely and I first learned about you because of your work on the Zodiac mystery and you said something once about the Golden State Killer that you tied into the Zodiac and that was that during the investigations into the into the Golden State Killer specifically after D'Angelo was apprehended they found that there were certain stressors in his life that drove him to kill again like more or less he's committing these crimes then in the 1980s it's around the birth of his children right that these are stressors in his life that would have affected his either mental state or perhaps just overall psychology to the point where it's driving him to commit these crimes again. Did I uh, misunderstand that or? Yeah, that, that's that's right. Like in the Golden State Killer case, there were so many, they spent a lot of time doing reports on 
um, you know, profiles and things to look for and things that would coincide. Um, you know, one of the crime scenes, one of the the witnesses that was attacked, one of the victims said, I think he said, I hate you, Bonnie, or I hate you, mommy. They weren't quite sure, but it turned out he had a Bonnie in his life. That was a, so in this report that, that I read, you know, there's this thing, be on the lookout for suspects that have a Bonnie in their circle of, you know, so there's these things that people, the investigators look for. And when a, when a, a suspect would pop up and they had a Bonnie that was a, a light switch would go off and say, okay, this person suspect has a Bonnie that they're connected to. They get elevated for a closer look. Um, but they had all these different things. They said, okay, why are these crimes stopping for five years and then firing back up and then stopping again? They said, look for new jobs, look for jail time, look for births of children, look for marriages, look for divorces. They had a laundry list of just different life things, life events that would happen to any of us that could coincide with these crimes. And then sure enough, looking back on D'Angelo, he gets fired in 1979. That's his, you know, he had, you know, he had killed Claude Snelling before, um, sort of in a, in an act to save himself and get away. But this was different. This after the time he was fired, uh, and he attacked uh, a, a victim there, they escaped and nobody ever lived after that. So the firing and the reason they escaped was because they heard him saying to himself, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill them. Like he was talking himself up, like talking himself into killing them. And they fled. They said, oh, we're not waiting around for this. They escaped out of their house. So that coincided with him being fired from the job. Then you've got 1981 to 1986. Nothing happens in, in that five-year period that we know of. Well, 1981, his child is born. 1986, when he kills again, his next child's born. So there's these things that, to me or you, you know, to normal people, they're just life events or, you know, birthdays, new jobs, divorces, a death in the family. I mean, there, there are things that are just part of everyday life. But to these serial offenders, they trigger something in them. And and their activity can be stopped or started again based on these things that you know are just part of life. But for whatever reason, it kicks them into another gear to where they stop stuff or start stuff. And you know that's in the Zodiac case, we see these pauses from 1971 to 1974. And I think the same thing could be very well at play. There's things going on in that person's life in the Zodiac case that make them want to stop and start activity. Um, and that's my theory, you know, is, is sort of that. And, it, you know, it was proven with the Golden State Killer case. We know that was that was true in that case. OK, though, but as far as the Golden State Killer operating in 1981 and 1986, there are some crimes that people try to attribute to the Golden State Killer on a more, you know, terms of like forming a hypothesis that happened in the 1990s, like one one definitely in the early 90s and then the later 90s. And even the Golden State Killer gets accused of committing the crimes in Australia, being the Australia's um, infamous serial offender, Mr. Cruel. There are lots of crimes that are tr that people think about. Maybe the Golden State Killer should be a suspect. Uh, to ask you a direct question, do you believe that the Golden State Killer's final crime was in 1986, or do you think there's any possibility that he committed murders or rapes after that? I think uh, I, I think it's likely that it wasn't. I think it was likely his last murder uh, in 1986. I wouldn't be surprised if there are other crimes we don't know about that haven't been connected to him along the way someplace. Rape, for example, is a very underreported crime. So if we know of all these rapes that he committed, I guarantee you there's more rapes that were committed that he, they did not come forward because a lot of rape victims just don't want to come forward. Um, so I, I, I would venture to guess he has a lot more crimes than we know of. I don't know that they're after 1986, though. A couple reasons why. You know, he was extremely athletic. You know, there were times when he was chased and leaping fences and 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 all kinds of different physical things that he was able to do. Um, by 1986, he wasn't able to do some of those things. 
Um, he's what, 1945, uh, I think he was 40 or 41 uh, at that time um, when he committed the last murder we know of. And at that crime scene, for example, he propped the TV up to step on to jump over a fence. Um, so he wasn't able to do the same physical things that he was able to do for all those years before. But also, a lot of times there's a thinking that testosterone is what drives a lot of these sexual predators a lot of time. And as you get older, men lose testosterone. So it's very possible that that's tied in to where these, you know, A, the physical capabilities of doing this just aren't there anymore. And B, his sexual desire, whatever is driving him for his sexual needs because of the drop in testosterone levels probably was going down as well. So I, I would venture to guess that 1986 was his last confirmed murder because of the those couple of reasons. Now, Morph, because you follow the Zodiac killer case very closely, there is actually um, a set of books, two books written by Ann Penn, whom I've had the opportunity to interview in the past. And she believes that the Golden State Killer and the Zodiac Killer are one and the same. Her books are called Serial Slaughter Zodiac Killer, and the other one is called What If Golden State Zodiac Killer Solved. Now, I know because we've you had the chance to correspond many times that you have a different Zodiac Killer suspect. So I'll just get right to the question. Why do you believe that this theory is incorrect, that the Zodiac Killer and the Golden State Killer are one and the same? Completely different MOs. They're just nowhere. They're night and day different. Killers can deviate a little bit from their, their patterns, their, what makes them do what they do. They don't go night and day different. Uh, any criminologist, any you know, criminal profiler will tell you they're, they're not the same killer. You know, Joseph D'Angelo was a sexual uh, sadist. He enjoyed inflicting pain and suffering on his victims. He enjoyed sitting there for hours at a time doing it. Um, that was what he got off on. That was what gave him the thrill to do this stuff. The Zodiac was an in and out, let me get out of here as fast as I can. Just completely different killer. You know, some people even use the Ted Kaczynski could be Zodiac theory. You know, he's another killer as well. He's somebody that didn't even like to be there when the, the, the actual crime happened. When somebody was blown up by one of his bombs, he was nowhere around. Um, you know, so you have the, the Golden State Killer that spends hours inflicting pain on his victims. Or the Golden State Killer, excuse me. The Zodiac Killer who does these quick blitz attacks and then gets out as fast as he can. You have somebody like Ted Gazinski that blows people up without even being there to see it. Um, so you're you're dealing with night and day differences in some of these offenders and you know don't take my word for it take the experts words of it people that you know people like john douglas um fbi profilers um any criminologist trained uh that are worth their you know weight in, in training are going to tell you there's no chance these killers are the same so and penn's theories on that are just completely uh nonsense in, in my opinion Yes, and uh, certainly, of course, there are lots of um, way, ways that people try to connect these different serial killer stories. I even mentioned how the Golden State Killer gets accused of being Mr. Cruel in Australia. But you also talked about some things that would affect D'Angelo's decision making in adulthood, the decline in testosterone, the decline in sexual desire. But a lot of people believe that the reason why there are differences among serial killers, like we talked about the Zodiac Unabomber, Golden State Killer, the reason why there are these differences among them is the events that happen in their childhood, like unhealed childhood traumas, or even if it's maybe incurable traumatic experiences in the in the childhood. Some people even say that so there's, there's a certain level of sociopathy or psychopathy that a person might be living in where there is no way to allow them to be rehabilitated or feel empathy. What exactly do you think could have happened in Joseph D'Angelo's childhood that would have driven him to become not only a serial killer, but a very vicious serial killer, sexual sadist, serial rapist, and even a burglar? Like, what do you think drove him to do this? I'm not a, a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. You know, somebody like that would have to examine him and really come to those conclusions. But in my own opinion, I mean, 
there were various things. For example, his father abandoned the family and went off and started a new family. And he named all his new kids the same name as his old kids. I, I mean, I don't know what that does to to a young kid that knows that his family's you know splintered and now his dad's having a new family and replacing them. I don't, I, you know, I, I would think that has an effect on them. But the the most traumatic thing I know of is that he witnessed his sister being raped by two military men. Um, for a, a young developing mind to to see that and experience that, I think something got imprinted on his mind at that point. Uh, and I'm not giving a pass for what he did. I'm not saying, oh, you should feel sorry for this guy because he experienced this as a kid. A lot of kids experience bad shit and don't go on to do that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? But not everybody's the same. Some people handle stuff differently. Some people, you get 10 people, nine of them might go through the same experience and come out okay. One of them doesn't, and they do these things that we can't even imagine them doing. So if I had to pick one thing, I would say it was clearly that, um, witnessing his his little sister being uh, raped. because I just don't know what that would do on a on the mind of a young person that's developing in that crucial stage where they're, you know, that's a, it's printed on his mind. So now he's going to associate sex, violence, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and how does that change him going forward? I mean, and after that, you know, he started peeping in windows and prowling and stuff like that as a kid, as a teenager. Um, and then he went on to just... Uh, terrible stuff after that so um maybe he was always going to be way i don't know but i i can't imagine some of the stuff that he experienced in his youth uh being positive yes but we've been talking about influences and you recently mentioned that they needed to look for someone who had a bonnie in his life maybe it's possible that he said i hate you bonnie and is this right bonnie was his ex fiance she was a woman who left him were they actually engaged yeah they were engaged and you know she started spotting the signs and uh, you know i forget his age i think he was in his 20s and i think she was 19 i can't remember off the top of my head but um she started seeing these little warning signs like he's controlling and he's um she he take her out on rides on a motorcycle and he'd do crazy things threaten people um i think he you know just just weird stuff that she didn't like and it just didn't seem normal to her and she eventually broke it off and then he showed up at her house and basically scared the entire family and um she was fortunate enough to escape from him and get away but obviously him saying that later on that must have affected him some way because if he's there at a crime scene sobbing in the corner by himself saying i hate you bonnie i hate you bonnie that must have played some some kind of role in what he was doing um or that's how he presented it as maybe he's maybe he's in his mind he's thinking she's responsible and he's getting his anger out against her by doing these bad things and maybe he regretted doing them um because there were there were odd moments where he'd do nice things for people that he had just raped. You know, one girl was cold, he gave her a blanket. Uh, you know, and then in one thing, one I, I think it was the same case. You know, there are there's so many cases of, of his that they sort of all bond together. But in another one, he was nice to her one second, but then she asked for water and he threw it in her face. Um, so there's these little back and forth things of one moment of nice things that he might be doing and one moment where he's just totally disrespecting them. Um, so I think maybe he was sort of wrestling with the human part of, of somebody that's cold, needs a blanket, somebody that's thirsty, wants water, you give it to him, but then he's got this evil side that's sort of winning out and saying, well, I'm not giving her water, I'll splash it in her face. You know what I mean? So it's kind of interesting to to hear all these witnesses and see them in the reports, every little thing he said and did to them and, and sort of piece it all together. Yes. Now, 
we talked about his failed relationship with Bonnie, but then the Golden State Killer would go on to marry a woman named Sharon. And from the descriptions that I've heard about her is that she was a rather unpleasant individual within their marriage. And I don't even want to, I'm going to be very careful with my adjectives because I don't want to misstate something. I'll just say something like hot headed, or perhaps she was a little bit uh, difficult to deal with. And um, have you um, encountered any descriptions about his wife? I've I've heard a lot of the same stuff that she's uh, wasn't very pleasant and wasn't overly friendly and maybe was a little bit cold. And I don't really I don't even because she's been so quiet and there hasn't been a lot of talk from her or insights from her. But I, I don't know what their actual relationship was like, their married life. I know they were. They stayed married for a while, even though they were sort of separated. Um, and I guess it was for the sake of benefits for the kids or whatever the reason was. But, um, you know, I, I have a hard time thinking because he was literally out seven nights a week. Plotting, looking at houses, casing places out, sneaking into people's homes undoing windows so that he could come back and climb through them later that night, stalking people, calling them. And he's going out all hours of the night to case places and surveil places and attack people. And I still, to this day, don't know how as a married person, you could sneak out of your house every night, all night and come home in the morning and your wife never find out that you've gone out in the middle of the night. I, I mean, I talked to everybody I know that's married and, and talked about this with, and they're all like, how's that possible? So there's, there's some people that think maybe she knew that he was going out and yes. whether she knew what he was doing or whether he, she didn't, maybe she just didn't care. Maybe she didn't care to know. I, I don't know. She has, again, she's been quiet about that. Now they did have separate rooms from what I understand uh, at some point during her marriage, but um, I, I just, find it hard to believe that you could go out every single night out of your house and your spouse not know it. Um, Again, I'm not accusing her of being part of it or having knowledge of it. Um, And again, maybe she just didn't ask questions. Maybe she didn't care where he was going. Um, But it's, it's hasn't sat well with me personally um, that, that the idea that he could just go out as frequently as he did and never, her never know about it or, or it not raise any f- red flags to her. Right. But like as somebody who follows true crime very closely, you'll know, like after the discovery of the so de- of the uh, Golden State Killer 2018, 19 and 2020, this story was everywhere. And there were all types of examinations into Joseph D'Angelo's life, as well as the people around him. And that is a theory that people have that his wife, Sharon, was an accomplice. Oh, and, and and you also didn't want to accuse her directly, but when they say accomplice, it can even be as simple as she's just turning a blind eye to it. I mean, she knows what's going on. She's just not intervening in any way, and that's why she has been so quiet. And I also don't know what to make of that because we can speculate until the cows come home, but unless you have like a confession or some type of evidence to say that somebody was an accomplice in murders. But I will respond to something that you did say. We talked previously about how the Golden State Killer's period of activity was either 73 or 74, thereabouts, to 1986. We're talking 12 years, 13 years, and when someone is committing crimes over that period, you talked about the absence that he would have needed to been away from home. I mean, shouldn't she have just been aware of this? 12 you know, years I, I, of stuff I, going on? You, you, again, you would think so. I, I know I couldn't sneak out of my house that many times I without my wife ever catching me um, at some point sneaking out. But again, That's I don't want to accuse her. It, it's important to to state that, you know, family members of these serial killers, they're victims too, in a different sense. Um, his kids didn't deserve this. His grandchildren don't deserve this. And his wife, you know, uh, you know, Obviously, unless she had some knowledge of it, you know, she doesn't deserve it. Um, I, I'd still like to hear more from her um, for her part. I hope, I don't know if she'll ever talk. Um, but it, it just, again, I, I just find it hard to believe that you, you could go out that many times 
get out of the house and and your your significant other just never catches it over that many years. I, I still don't know when he slept. That's still one of the mysteries to me because he had a full time job as a police officer and he was out. Um, he was out nights either casing places, stalking people or doing attacks. So to me, I, I, I haven't figured out when the guy slept. Uh, he had to sleep. He's human. But I, I wonder if he was just maybe pulling up in his police car sometime during the day and just hiding behind a couple, a tree and just nodding off for a couple hours when he could get some sleep. I don't know what he was doing, but it, it's clear because if you look at the activity reports and the police reports where the areas where he was prowling, it was just every single night, every single night there was either an attack or a prowler. Then he'd move to another area in the town and the same thing would happen. Um, just nonstop. So he, he had to sleep at some point, but still haven't figured out when he did. And some people can also function on a very small amount of sleep. Like some people regularly get four hours of sleep every night, and that's just how they operate. So that would require probably half the amount of time as somebody else. But as you pointed out, you still have to do it at some point. And, yeah. Um, and just say, I mean, just think if you, I, I know me anyway, if, if I get like two or three hours of sleep, just feel, imagine how bad you feel and you're not performing at your best yeah. when you're doing stuff. So, you know, and, and to me, his job was secondary. He wasn't a, an exceptional police officer. He had good training. He was part of the anti-burglary burglary force, um, anti-robbery force. And that's how he knew all the things that he knew. Um, but he wasn't an exceptional cop. He didn't do anything special. He wound up getting fired for stealing stuff. Um, so he wasn't great at that. His primary job was being the Golden State Killer. That's really what he was doing. And his job as a police officer was just a mask for that. Okay, though, but uh, Morph, you are the co-author of two books. The Criminology Podcast presents The Case of the Zodiac Killer and The Case of the Golden State Killer. And, of course, these are the um, texts from your podcast. What was the research process like when you were composing the episodes for the Criminology Podcast on the Golden State Killer? It was a, a lot of reading and as much material as I had on the Zodiac case, there was far more on the, the Golden State Killer case um, because you had so many jurisdictions. You had, you know, it started off in Visalia, um, then it's Sacramento, I mean, Rancho Cordova. Um, and then it, it moves around central Northern California, then it drops down to Southern California. And you've got these other jurisdictions and the murders are, are starting. So you've got all these different files and reports that to tell the story accurately, you've got to go through all these materials with, with the Zodiac case. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket, you know, there's five, known, you know, whatever it is known attacks and that's it. Anything else you could say is a possible attack. But as far as confirmed attacks, you know what the number is. Here, you've got to go through all these burglaries that happen, all these prowling instances, all these um, attacks, break-ins, people that were finding things moved around in their house, people that were finding ropes on, in, under their couch cushion. Um, he, they were getting calls, you know, getting uh, harassing calls, heavy breathing calls, hang-up calls, things like that. Then you've got all the murder details to go through from all these different murders. So, you know, if you if you stack the Golden State Killer files against the Zodiac files, there's just no comparison. There's so much more material in the in the Golden State Killer case. So I had to read that, and I read through those reports, and then had to reread them. And I was reading, you know, I would I would read probably four to six, four to eight hours a day then write another four to eight hours a day. Then the next day I would just repeat it. I was doing that like Monday through Friday. I was doing 16 hours worth of work, you know, a day sometimes, you know, five, six days a week. And then to, to try and tell the story over, over the season that we did on the case. And it was, it took a lot, a lot out of me. Like I said, I was very burned out at the end. I took some time off. I just didn't want to do anything. Um, but during the time, you know, I was constantly, like I mentioned, very paranoid, locked, checking to make sure doors were locked, you know, checking to make sure the alarm was on, 
looking up to make sure my lights were on out back. I mean, just all kinds of things that I never thought about or didn't think that much about. Every night I was just worried about these things and and looking at them. That's how reading all this stuff that he was doing, how paranoid it made me. Um, so it just, it's it, sort of a different feel than the Zodiac case um, altogether. Okay, and I have one final question for you, and that is that you've had the opportunity to see a true crime case that you followed closely end up with a resolution. More or less, for all intents and purposes, the Golden State Killer case has been solved. How would you feel if you are not able to see a resolution to the Zodiac Killer mystery in your lifetime? I mean, I'd be bummed out, but at this point, it's been so long that I don't know that there'll be a resolution. You know, some of the promising DNA stuff has sort of faltered, and I, I feel like if they had more DNA stuff, it would have come out by now. Um, but at the same time, I know that they're not in a rush to solve, you know, 50 something year old cold cases when they've got hot, fresh cases and, and they're shorthanded, underfunded as it is, because California's having some issues um, with, with crime and they've got to stay on top of all of that. So I really think the Zodiac case is sort of on their back burner. I don't know how aggressively they're trying to solve it, um, but I'd love to see the case solved. The, the key difference is, you know, the, the, the Zodiac killer case is, you know, because a lot of the East Area Rapists, the Golden State Killer, his rape kits were destroyed when the statute of limitations ran out. So the evidence collecting that they had was really from, you know, the 1980s. Um, you know, all, a lot of the 70s rape stuff was just thrown away. It was discarded because they couldn't prosecute anybody, even if they identified them later on. Um, whereas the, the Zodiac stuff was from a decade before. So now you're talking physical evidence. Uh, it wasn't preserved as well. It wasn't handled as well. It was older. Um, not to mention some of the DNA, for example, in the Zodiac case, we have to presume that they're using touch DNA off the bindings that he handled or off the shell casings that he touched or off the seals of the envelopes. They're using that kind of DNA, but how good were those envelopes preserved? In the Zodiac case, he left so much semen at so many murder scenes that they collected. Um, they had that, which is, a you know, very good DNA and it was stored. In mean, the Golden State Killer case. In right? the Golden State Killer case, excuse me, yeah. They, there was so much DNA from, from that semen from these rape scenes um, that they stored that and preserved it. And in, in the, the one sample they used to ultimately build the profile of it for him for genealogy, uh, was collected off one of the murder victims and stored and frozen um, so that they, you know, the, he had the, you know, the medical examiner at the time had the forethought that down the road they might want this for something. Um, so he had, they had a perfect sample of D'Angelo's uh, semen, his DNA that he had left at one of these crime scenes. And that's what ultimately did him in and was able to identify him. We don't have anything that strong in, as far as a smoking gun in the Zodiac case. Um, so that's why I fear that it won't be solved or it's not going to be solved as easily as the Zodiac or as the Golden State Killer case was. OK, and I've been talking to Mike Morford, author of the Criminology podcast, presents the case of the Golden State Killer. But more if you work with lots of different projects, podcasts and pieces of entertainment, is there anything that you would like to promote? Well, I mean, you can always find me. I'm, I'm active on Twitter. I have the tw Twitter slash X. I have the uh, handle at true crime guy. Um, you can come over, check out all the podcasts I work on, go to abjackentertainment.com. That's my, um, network for all my shows. Uh, criminology is my biggest podcast. It's the most well-known one that's been out the longest. That's the one where I've covered both the Zodiac case and the golden state killer case. So if anybody wants to check out those seasons, they're full seasons on both of those cases. Yes. And you also work with the show three men in a mystery, right? Yeah, I've done three. We had, we were sort of disbanded it, but you never know. We might put out another episode down the road. Um, but yeah, I worked with John Lorden on that and uh, Gray Hughes, who do a lot of good YouTube work. And because I follow John Lorden's uh, pages, too, I saw that that got aired on Roku, like put on television into a uh, one of the um, true crime channels on Roku aired that show on TV, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you can you can nowadays you can sort of find us. Uh, whether it's YouTube or on Roku or whatever, you're going to find some way to 
to um, find a lot of the stuff that we've done. And obviously with podcasts, you can listen to them on your phone, on, on, you know, on your computer or whatever. So, you know, people can always find them easily enough and, and check them out. Mike Morford, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.